In this project, we'll look at what happens when you try to scale the small world we've been building into gigantic Earth and beyond-sized planets. Specifically, we'll be covering using floating origins to build even bigger procedural worlds. The problem we're trying to solve is, what happens when I take my dinky little world that I've been building up until now and try to jack it up to Earth-sized and beyond? The answer? It looks like crap. So today we're going to be exploring why it looks like crap and how to start fixing those issues. Now, just to recap, we've been building out a series on 3D world generation and procedural terrain in JavaScript and 3.js. There's an entire series to catch up on if you haven't already, starting with basic mesh generation using height maps, planetary scale level of detail, advanced texturing techniques, and approaches to threading. It might seem that we're pretty much done now with the whole planet generation thing, time to go make No Man's Sky. Or maybe not. The reality is, is the planets that we've building so far have been more like dinky little asteroids and moon-sized ones. So how do we build something bigger? Before we begin, make sure you've subscribed to this channel and on Twitter so that you're notified when new videos are released and you can also get previews of what's coming up. So then, how do we make this significantly bigger? Easy. We just go back into the code here, and there's a constant up here in terrain.js for planetary radius. Right now it's set to about 4,000 meters or so. Let's jack it up by adding a bunch of zeros. Obviously, since you're watching a video about why and how to fix this, just cranking the number up is going to fail. So we'll load it up, and at first glance, this seems to be working out. Planet is goddamn huge now, we really have to crank the camera speed to get in, but as we zoom down to the planet's surface, we start seeing some major problems. Going right up to the ground now, this is probably about as low as you'd go to place a character down, and this looks like garbage. The ground is shaking and shimmering and just going nuts. So, what went wrong? Let's take a step back and refactor the code a bit before diving in. Since we're going to be playing with the planetary radius often, let's move some of the variables that are scattered throughout the code. Specifically, I'm talking about the constants declared at the top of terrain.js, the ones hard-coded into graphics.js, and the top of texture splatter.js. The problem is every time we want to go change, say, the height of the terrain or the size of the planet, we have to remember to go screw around in multiple places. Instead, we'll create this terrain constants.js file and just cram everything in here. Now, if we want to go change the terrain height, it's super easy. Just change it here. Now we can load it up and see the change. I can go back in here, change the radius of the planet from 4,000 to 8,000, and voila, again, it's all good. Even the scattering implementation picks up the changes. All right, with that out of the way, let's go back to figuring out why this looks so bad. Let's jack the size of the planet back up. Now, we'll wait for it to load, and let's move around a bit. First thing you'll notice is the texturing seems off. But switching to wireframe, you can see that it's not just the textures. As I pan the camera around slowly, look at the mesh. The triangles themselves are jiggling around and going a bit crazy. Keep in mind that I'm not moving the camera at this point, so there's no recalculation of the mesh happening. To understand what's going on, we need to take a step back and understand the representation of numbers in a computer. All of our meshes are using floating point numbers. Floating point numbers are fantastic tools in programming. They're super useful at representing things like positions, directions, texture coordinates, but they do have their limitations. Understanding these weaknesses is the key to fixing this problem. Let's look at how a floating point number is defined. A 32-bit float consists of a sign bit, 8 bits of exponent, and 23 bits of mantissa, or in other words, the fractional part. The problem is with the mantissa, or the fractional component. There's only 23 bits of precision there, which in general means that you get roughly 6 to 7 digits of numerical precision. Let's run through some quick examples. Say I have the number 10. So the corresponding float looks like this, which means basically it's 2 to the power 3 times 1.25, which equals 10. Now let's do 10.001. This is a little bit more complicated. That number isn't perfectly represented by a floating point number, so this ends up being 2 to the power 3 times 1.250125, etc. And notice that it's not exactly 10.001. It's actually 
10.0010004 and a bunch of crap. This is an important point. Floating point numbers just try to get you as close as they can. So now let's watch this fail really hard and fast when working with positions. Let's start with a position. Let's say that you're at 10.0 on the x-axis. Now in floating point, if you recall, everything is fine and you get 10.0 exactly. If I move a millimeter, that's going to be 10.001 and a bunch of crap. So close enough. That's fine. So far everything is good enough for a game. We're off by like a millionth. Who cares? But now let's scale that up to planetary numbers. So the new x coordinate is now 100,000. Remember when I said they only had about six to seven digits of precision? That means if you add 0 0.001 or one millimeter to 100,000 in floating point, you end up with 100,000. You completely lose the 0 0.001 because there just isn't enough precision to handle it. You might be thinking, but JavaScript has 64-bit floats, not 32-bit. Yes, JavaScript does, but the bottleneck here is the GPU, not the CPU, and we're dealing with 32-bit floats there. And using doubles everywhere also doesn't fundamentally fix the problem, it's just a duct tape solution. Let's talk about some strategies to fix this. One super common approach is using fixed point numbers. These are basically integers that you treat as if they have a fixed fractional component. They're amazing for reliability, but that's a deep change to the code to support this. Instead, let's go back to that original example of 10.0. Notice how, near the origin, adding all these small numbers works fine. Near the origin, doing calculations is going to easily give you sub-millimeter accuracy, but the further you move away, the worse the accuracy is. So, I'm going to make a big jump here. What this means is, if, instead of calculating our meshes and worlds as if they're at some static point in space, we calculate everything relative to the position of the camera. This is called having a floating origin. And the gist of the approach we'll use today is that when we go to generate a chunk of terrain, let's say the camera is here at position XYZ, which is super, super far away from the origin. If we were to generate the mesh in absolute coordinates at this point, it's going to be a mess because of precision issues. Instead, we'll treat the camera as the origin and move the world around it instead. So we'll be generating the mesh right by the camera, and then as the camera moves, we'll actually just offset that chunk of terrain in the opposite direction. In the end, it comes out to exactly the same thing visually, but it allows everything close to the camera to use small numbers that can be represented more precisely by floating point numbers. Let's get this all into code. The first thing we need to do is go modify the worker code to generate meshes relative to a new origin. All the mesh generation code is done here in the terrain builder threaded worker.js file. We get a message down here from the main thread that tells us to build the mesh, and this rebuild function takes care of generating all of the new positions, normals, that kind of stuff. There's also a bunch of parameters here that are passed down from the terrain class, stuff like the local to world matrix, the mesh resolution, radius of the planet, etc. We'll just add a new parameter called origin, and this will be the origin that we'll build the particular chunk of terrain relative to. After that, it's a few simple changes to the position generation. Previously, we used to generate all of the mesh coordinates in a local space, and then rely on setting a group transform to move them to the right world space position. That's nice and simple, but it's also part of the problem. So back here in the terrain class, we're not going to set the groups transform anymore. We'll be generating the mesh and transforming it ourselves. Now in the loop down here, we take the position and apply the local to world matrix to move it into world space, and then subtract the origin here. This effectively brings the positions back close to the origin. Since we pass the origin through the parameters, we have to actually go back and thread this through. These parameters are passed from terrain builder threaded, so here in rebuild chunk, we've got all the parameters being packaged up for the worker. Most of these are actually passed through from above, so we'll add the origin here on this line, and then we need to go up a level. In terrain.js, there's a function here in create terrain chunk, which is responsible for calling the builder to create new terrain chunks, and it's here that we can add the new origin parameter. All we need to do is pass in the current camera position. Now, remember how all of the world geometry is generated relative to the camera? That means we need to render as if the camera is centered at the origin. So, in terrain shader, we need to modify the view matrix. 
Specifically, we'll need to create a new terrain camera matrix that will be mostly a copy of the current view matrix, but set at the origin. There's one last little change that we need to do here, and that's in terrainchunk.js. We need to set the position of each chunk relative to the current camera, taking into account the origin. If you remember our drawing, each chunk was generated around the origin, and as the camera moves, we need to calculate the delta between the terrain's origin point and the current camera position. What that means is we'll need an update function here in the terrain chunk class, and we'll just subtract the current camera position from the origin and set that as the position for this chunk. And that's it. Just some relatively painless changes, and once we load it up, the train isn't all jittery anymore. We can zoom in and out now, and there's no catastrophic issues with the mesh. Now, obviously this isn't the only hurdle we need to fix. The train still looks like garbage since the texturing follows the camera around since the position is local to the camera. I think we can fix that in the future more easily by passing down some repeating world space coordinates or something like that. The seams are still there in the terrain. Yeah, I'll fix those at some point. They just need a skirt or something to fix those. And if we zoom out far enough, well, first off, the planet doesn't really look like a planet now, does it? It looks like a splotchy green and brown thing, but even just ignoring that, if we go far enough, this happens. Kind of looks like it's really hairy or it's on fire or something, I don't know. Anyway, we've hit the limits of the far clipping plane, so we need to do something about that too. Baby steps. We'll get there eventually. Next video in the series will address more of these issues. Hope you enjoyed this. If you haven't already, subscribe both here and on Twitter. You'll get notifications for when new videos drop and previews of what's coming up soon. I also chat with people and try to get a sense of what you want to see next. Make sure to like the video and leave a comment about what you want to see covered in a future tutorial. The code is all up on GitHub, so knock yourself out. Like always, do whatever you want, it's free to use. If you don't understand something, feel free to ask. Cheers everyone.